everybody to a live lesson at Atlantic International University. Today's date is the 23rd of February, 2023. Interesting day, 2-23, 2-23. If that means anything. Anybody does numerology, I don't know. But um, what we, today we're going to have a guest speaker, Sophia Petro, who studies religious studies. And so... Sophia Petro, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're going to be talking about today? Sure. So I graduated with my Master's of Divinity from a school in Boston. Um, I am looking at different doctorate programs right now to begin a doctorate of psychology program um, to practice somewhere in the Northeast. We'll see which program I choose. I've always had a very deep interest in mental health and how that works together with religious studies and with theology. I wasn't always interested in that. That kind of developed throughout my years of studying. Um, and so today that's kind of putting together what I've learned um, in a more uh, professional or academic or set setting, which was theology. And then um, what my knowledge has been so far in understanding how theology and the church interacts with the topic of mental health or psychology. So it'll be interesting to, to, to know what you have found in the power of, of Christian theology teachings to actually heal people's minds and their worries and bring peace. I would imagine that's the goal is to bring peace. So there's lots of things that we can talk about. There's peace with the environment, there's inner peace, there's forgiveness, all kinds of things. So I have a feeling you're going to bring up a lot of interesting subjects today, right? Yes, there's a lot. <laughs> so do you have a do you have a presentation to show? I do. Yes, I am. Whenever whenever you say and give me the go, I can share my screen and start sharing my um. Do you see down slide. below? Do you do you see the down below? Let me first make you a co-host. I think that'll give you a better chance to see that down at the bottom of the screen. Do you see an option to share screen? Yeah, I do. I do. So when, is, is it, a, would you like me to begin the, the presentation? Unless you have something more to say. No, I think I'm, I'm, I'm good to go. I just want to let everyone know again that, um, that if there's any like clarifying questions or, or anything at any point you can jump in, but then at the end, um, I included like a certain, a special section where I'll turn the slides off and we can just have like a Q and A or um, discussion. <laughs> Let me yeah. see a show of hands. How many people actually study Christian theology, the Bible, things like that? Anybody? Got one? Is anybody religious? Do you, do you study teachings? Do you study spirituality of any type? You can raise your hand. Okay. All right, I think we're ready to go. Sophia okay. Petro. In my slides here. Oh, we do have a couple of hands going up. Do you want to take yeah. early questions? Sure. sure. Yeah, I can definitely do that. Let me get rid of this screen. We have a hand up from Ernest. Ernest. Let me go ahead and ask to unmute here. So some Rosie, people have their camera off. Rosie, Rossi Praise TV. I have a feeling okay. there's there's a religious connection there with praise. <laughs> um, no, no, no. Don't no. bring me on. Don't bring me on video, please. <laughs> uh, no, okay. just so we can hear you. Yeah, can you hear me now? Can everyone hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, um, good to be here at this time and uh, I'm happy to be part of this. Uh, because um, I have a TV show where I talk about religious matter, basically. And so I'm very interested. I'm a practicing Christian. I won't say I'm very religious. <laughs> so, but I'll, I'm one who, um, who advocates for Christ, you know, and um, most of my talk show is based on religious matters as it affects us as humans, as Christians, and how, you know, we can better ourselves. So um, I'm, I don't have any questions to ask now until I listen to you. All right. And then, then let's get started with the presentation. Okay. I think we're all ready to go. Okay. Sophia, Petro, 
Take the stage. Can everybody see that? Dr. Edward, maybe you could confirm? Yes, I can. All right, great. All right, so mental health and Orthodox Christian tradition. I picked this first picture um, because a lot of times in my life up till now, I've met people who might not know about the Orthodox Christian tradition, which is the church that I'm part of. And the Orthodox Christian tradition is quite an old tradition. Um, we start from the apostolic tradition from the 12 disciples of Christ. And that's old, that's about 2000 years old tradition. Um, and in this picture, there's a village that near the camera is kind of like an older village an older architectural style, but in the distance, you can see newer buildings that are considered more modern. And I chose this picture because today, usually mental health and a lot of topics that are coming up in the past 100 years are, are new phenomenons, new challenge, challenges that both pastors and mental health professionals are dealing with. And now what we're talking about today is kind of bringing in to, together the world, the ancient world of tradition, which might at first not be considered having a ton to do with modern phenomenon and bringing it together. So that's why I chose this picture. I thought that was kind of interesting. Okay, so just to kind of give a little roadmap of where we're going today, I know that always helps me when I'm listening to any type of talk. I like to kind of give a little bit of an intro of where we're going. So first, we're going to talk about what I mean, at least for the sake of this talk, by mental health and Orthodox Christianity, because a lot of times um, there can be differing understandings of what a term is, and it can change depending on, on what the talk is. So for first, I'd like to just kind of give a quick background on historically what each of these are in practice and what they are practically. So practically, mental health includes emotional, psychological, and social well-being. And again, um, this is for the sake of this talk. There's so many different definitions. Um, so I'm just giving that, um, that disclamatory note from now. Um, also, mental health affects how we think, feel, and act. And it's affected by bi biological factors like life experiences and family history. And all of these can contribute or affect in some way, mental health, um, when stability or problems or any issues someone might have, they might be serious or very um, not that serious at all. And then Orthodox Christianity, its focus is on the health of the tripartite being and tripartite is simply a more fancy term to describe the health of the mind, the body and the soul. That's a tripartite being that in Orthodox Christian Christianity, we see the human person as and it focuses on the health of each of these three aspects. And for this health, there is a belief in that there needs to be a daily labor and effort from both the mind and the heart. It isn't something that happens in a day, but it's, it's a daily effort and a daily labor. And that brings to mind, I have a quote there from St. Maximus the Confessor, who said that theology without action is the theology of demons, meaning that if you have a church, if you have any type of religiosity, that claims theological truths, but it doesn't have a call to action to be, and then we'll get a little bit into what this action looks like, then that so, can't be theology. Yes, yes. Sophia, can I, can I ask, does that go along with that term of introspection on a daily basis? Absolutely. Good. Absolutely, yes, yes. A theology without that cannot be, cannot be from God because it calls, it calls action on our part. Um, and then thirdly, the main goal of Orthodox Christianity is salvation. Um, and St. Theophan says that consequently, this is why it is the most difficult thing to do. It is not an, an easy task. Um, are there any questions up to this point? I'm not able to see everyone, so I can't see raised hands, but I can hear someone if anyone wants to jump in at any point. Can you give a little distinction of what Orthodox Christianity is? Because people might think, well, that does that come from Greece, pr right. principally? Yeah. So, yeah. So it actually, that's why I have this slide right here to kind of give a little bit of a background of, of what does an Orthodox Christian mean when they say, I'm Orthodox Christian. And so kind of, I know there's a lot of dates here, but I figured this might be helpful. On the left, there are some major dates that have to do with mental care, men mental health and pastoral care. Um, specifically in the, in the kind of the view of pastoral care where now we have clinical pastoral education units um, and we have cl 
clinical care in hospitals and in clinical settings and church settings. So there's some dates there. We have in 400 BCE, which was around the time that we believe Deuteronomy was written, we have the word appear in Hebrew called council, and that's a big deal. And then in 70 CE, we have the book of Acts, and we have the word pop up in Greek called diakonia, ministry. And this wasn't just ministry of food, but it was ministry of emotional and social support for people who were underserved in the community. Then in 1892, that's kind of a big jump, but it's just an, a quick kind of little overview of mental, mental health and pastoral care. In 1892, the American Psychological Association was established in the University of Pennsylvania, which is, I honestly think why it's kind of viewed as a more ma modern phenomenon, but there are theologians and um, people involved in mental health care who kind of see this as a very ancient tradition of taking care of our mind, body, and soul, right? And then in 1896, we have the first psychological clinic, also at the University of Pennsylvania. Now on the right, there are some important dates that have to do with Christianity, not Orthodox Christianity per se, but just Christianity. Of course, we have in 30, around 33 CE is when Christians believe that Christ died and resurrected. Then in 150, unlike what most people believe, usually when we think of a break in the church, it's usually, usually associated with 1054. But in actuality, the first schism or the first major disagreement, big disagreement that the church had was around 150 CE, and that was called the Marcionite schism. Obviously, that's way, way too complicated and detailed to get into, into details, but essentially that's when the church started having major discussions on who God is and what are we supposed to do to interact with him and what does that mean in our daily lives. So that was the first major disagreement. And then in 451, we have the next major division, which created what we call the Eastern and the Oriental Orthodox churches. Those were two now major churches. Um, and again, there's just some very important theological differences that emerged. The Orthodox church that I'm a part of, which I was born into, is one of the Eastern Orthodox churches. Um, and there's, there's many hundreds of Eastern Orthodox churches, um, which are all in communion. And then there are also Oriental Orthodox churches that are in communion. That, that's the only division that we had so far, 451. And then in 1054, we have the division that most people are familiar with, which is the Great Schism. And from this division is what we know as the Roman Catholic Church officially becoming its own Western Church and the Eastern Church in the, in the Eastern world. Um, and then from there, of course, if we fast forward more years ahead, we have Martin Luther King and his 95 Theses and the Protestant Church emerges. So that's kind of a... Um, a little bit of a background on what I mean by Orthodox and on, on different branches. Uh, does that, do you think that um, answers your question, Dr. Edward, or anyone else who might be wondering what I mean? It does for me. Okay. I'm so waiting to see if there's anybody, I don't see any questions yet in chat. Yeah, I'm trying to keep an eye on that too. I, please, anybody jump in, yeah, if there's any questions. I know that was a lot of dates, but I figured it was it was good to just have as a basis to know what we're talking about here. All right, so we've gone over where they come from practically, where they come from historically, when I say Orthodox Christian tradition and mental health. And I just want to kind of put it in perspective that currently, as of 2020, so these numbers might have even increased, every one in five adults live with a mental illness. And that could be, um, it varies in severity. That um, doesn't mean that one in five people have actually been to therapy or received any type of help. But when I say mental illness, that could be any type of um, anxiety, any type of depression, um, any type of traumatic event. And that has increased exponentially. Um, that is a new phenomenon that we're seeing today. Um, and so that's just kind of putting it in perspective how much of a contemporary issue and topic this is, even if someone does not directly study it in their academic career. Okay, so this brings us to the third and kind of um, focused main part of our talk is I've drawn from some of the work that I've done for an academic institute over the past couple of summers that works with youth. Um, and we, we serve them for the length of 10 days and we have three sessions. And there are a lot of things I've learned um, of what faith communities have to say about 
theology and the topic of mental health interacting. And not just in Christian communities, but also from uh, professors and classmates I've had from other very ancient traditions that are not Christians have similar things to say that can sometime, instead of trying to be insensitive, just people might not be aware of how these two arenas interact. And there can be things that are said that are in, that are problematic. Um, they might have some, some level of truth to them. So when they're said, if someone doesn't know any better, it can sound correct. And what ends up happening is this can cause a lot of damage um, for how we view someone if we meet someone who has a, some type of emotional struggle or if we have an emotional struggle or psychological struggle of any kind. So I've really been reading and researching um, and these are points that I've derived, not from my own opinion, but within the tradition of the Orthodox Christian tradition. And again, each ancient tradition has their own wise people and wise words from the fathers and mothers of, of their church or their tradition that have things to say about this topic. For today, obviously I'm sharing from people and saints and fathers and mothers who are who are from my church. Um, but that does not mean that there are not people from other traditions that have things to say about this topic. And many times, incredibly, um, they're, they're similar. Um, ancient traditions have many wise things to say. So I'll be covering like about six different sentences that I've uh, heard in one way or another of people who might be well-intentioned have to say about these two topics. And they always have to do with one of two problems. One is over dichotomizing. And that's another fancy word of saying, taking two things, in this case, mental health and Orthodox Christianity, and overly separating the two, making too big of a divide. And that's kind of one main issue. And the other one is fear. So each of these problematic statements will have to do with one of these two issues. And then I'll kind of give a little snippet on what is the church, what is the tradition, or the fathers or some of the saints have to say about this misunderstanding. So that's kind of how I've set it up. So for our first one here, something that I've heard is along the lines of, if your faith is strong in God or the saints or whatever faith that we're referring to here, you really shouldn't seek out any help for mental or emotional struggles because the faith, sh it should be enough if it's strong enough. I've heard this many times, um, and again, it's it's often very well intentioned and comes from possibly very faithful and spiritual people. Um, the issue here is there's a huge division um, or a seeming division between these two topics, and there's a saint who's from Greece and he's more of a of a modern saint, written from 1846 to 1920. He reflects really well um, a very a very interesting view on how we cannot separate these two like such there's such a wide gap and in his work mothers in the upbringing of children he actually speaks that with about how within us there are two trees growing within our soul and these two trees are growing within the same the same ground the same soil and they each need equal attention and care and what does he say these two trees are he says that they are the tree that has to do with knowledge of the mind or scientific knowledge, or for this pur purpose, we could say the study of the more um, medical side of mental health. And then he says there's the tree of the spiritual life, and they're equally important. And he talks about the issues that can arise if a person decides to water or tend to one of these trees more. Um, and I think that's a beautiful picture of kind of the solution to the misunderstanding of overly dichotomizing this this view of the medical world of mental health and spirituality. And of course, there's a lot to be said about each of these points, but I'm giving a, a quick overview. Um, so we have time to go over all, them all and also have some discussion if, if need be, if someone has some questions. And please stop me at any point again. Okay, we have a couple of uh, ideas coming in. All right. Here's, here's a comment from Akande. Please. Can I get an explanation that most of the problems the whole world is facing today, that religion has not seriously contributed to it? So the problems in the world are not the cause of religion. Your response? Religion has not seriously contributed to it. Um, Akande, could you, I just wanna make sure that I totally understand um, your question. So 
I think you're asking, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that in your experience, the world today is facing mostly problems that are not related to religion? Kande? Dr. Edward, do you think that's... Um, I'm going to ask Kande to unmute. Sophia, hi. Yes, uh, hi, my, hi my, my take on that, I think, is uh, you know, uh, a lot of times religion gets the blame for some yeah. of the problems we have. So she's asking if you can show support or evidence that does not equate uh, some of the serious problems that we're having squarely on religion. That's, I think that's the point. Oh, okay, I got you. Thank you very much for that clarification. Um, Rick, I see, it unmuted. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's a really good point. And really, Akande, that's something that I'm really passionate about. And one of the reasons that I'm so interested in this topic um, because a lot of the times when we have these misunderstandings, like the one that we just went over here um, about if your faith is strong enough, you shouldn't seek out mental health. And a lot of people might listen to this advice. And now let's play it out. Someone doesn't seek out mental health or mental health help, right? And they have an issue and now they're drowning and they need help and they're not asking for help to the, to the right person. And then the world can kind of see that as, well, the church is toxic because this is just one example, of course, there's so many examples, but this can be one example. Um, you know, a religious community or a church community or any type of a spiritual community is toxic because in my experience, I had a friend who didn't receive help and then they got hurt in this way. And that's valid. It's so sad that that person got hurt and that friends around them can be upset. And I can see why it can be blamed on a, a faith community. Because if there are misunderstandings that are preached as, as gospel or as correct theology, but they might just be opinions or again, misunderstandings, then it can be pinned on the fault of the church, right? Or its theology. When in actuality, sometimes there's a deeper truth there that there's a, there's a problematic statement. And so my goal and my interest is trying to understand where do these misunderstandings come from, which a lot of times then the world once it plays out, it looks and is understood as someone's fault or the church's fault at large. And trying to take out all these weeds and all of these competing voices in understanding when, yes, people in the church definitely make mistakes, even religious leaders, even religious leaders, and trying to see what is the ideal within theology? What is it that the church or its tradition has taught in its ideal form? And then where are the ways that maybe we as humans have kind of misconstrued it or people have fallen short of, of sharing this message or tradition with others and kind of and kind of seeing the difference and also how they connect. I don't know if that if that helps a comment. There's another question here about what is the difference between faith and reason? Absolutely, yes. So um, I'm not sure who asked that, but this this section that I'm referring to from St. Nicarius is one of the best um examples i can think of of uh not having to get like into a a huge theological in-depth discussion which not everyone might be interested in or have studied um really just looking at it as saint nectarius talks about two trees in a garden um and the the text goes into detail saying how if one of these trees for example reason let's say reason isn't tended to and you say okay well i'm just not going to learn anything and I'm going to sit and only attend to spiritual matters. Um, he talks about how this is very problematic to the human person because it'll the human person will be out of balance. And this is something I'll mention at the end, but the Orthodox Christian tradition in the wisdom of, of its fathers always talks about balance and um, really steering clear of extremes. So there is nothing, there is nothing wrong with reason and there is nothing wrong with spirituality. And together they work beautifully. Um, and even, even in our tradition, ascetics and monastics or people who one might say are only attending to the spiritual life. In actuality, if one reads about their life, they're incredibly active um, in, their, in the world of their mind. Whether they're reading texts or whether they've actually memorized texts, um, they, their, their mind is constantly working. It's, it's, it's not an only kind of introspective spiritual practice of 
sitting and not doing anything. It's a very active process of both mind and heart together, working together. Um, Sophia, have you heard that some people say that faith is 100% of spirituality? All you, all you need is faith, nothing more. Don't even think, just have faith. What do you, is that? That's kind of a difference between orthodox traditions and sort of modern traditions of Christianity. What do you think? Yeah. So again, it's, it's kind of like this topic. I've heard it again and again and again, not just with mental health, not just with mental health topics, um, but with a lot of other topics. And I do think that, like, that we humans tend to like kind of going to extremes and that's understandable. It's because we like, I even like being sure, right? I like knowing what my day is going to look like tomorrow and I want it to be clear. Um, and this might be even harder for people whose personalities are like scheduling and being sure of things. But in the tradition of the, of the church throughout history, the church has never been a church of extremes. Everything is, like I said, balanced. Um, and here we have this example that it's not one or the other. It's not, um, you know, if, you, if your faith is strong, all your problems will be fixed. You're, you'll have as much money as you need and you're never going to get sick and there aren't going to be problems. That's just not true. Um, it, it, that's not the way that life is. And the goal of faith is not to not have problems, but to have it to navigate the problems that will arise um, in, indubitably. It's, it's impossible to avoid. And in the view of the Orthodox Christian tradition, as I mentioned before, briefly, the goal ultimately is salvation um, in, a, in a life that comes after this one in full awareness that this one is not perfect. And of course, each tradition has its own belief on what happens after death, but that is what the Orthodox Christian tradition has to say um, in terms of this life and the life that comes after. Do you see that new question that just popped up? Let me check it out and see. Um, I agree. Rossi oh, Price TV. Can, can a theologian be regarded as a true Christian? That is a really good question, yeah. um, Rossi. Yeah. So there's actually, um, and I always try whenever I speak to as much as possible, I don't like giving my opinion um, because I, I truly rely on, on the wisdom of people that have come before me. And in, for this talk, the wisdom and tradition of the people who um, sat down and talked about these topics for over a thousand years ago. So I have a quote, Rossi, for you from um, one of the fathers of the church. And he talks about how if a theologian speaks about theology and he does not have love, or he speaks about theology in judgment of others, there's a high chance of what will happen is that theology becomes like poison flowing through the veins of this so-called theologian. And, and he or she is no longer speaking the life-giving words and um, the loving words of a loving God, but instead is now promulgating their own message, um, their own toxicity and, and poison and self-esteem and all the selfish desires that humans can fall into. And so it's very, very easy um, for that to happen if one isn't careful um, to look at whether whether when we speak about theology, and a lot of the fathers talk about this, it's not something that should just be flippantly spoken about as if, oh, well, I'm the expert. I've read now these many books and I have all the answers and this is exactly how it is. Many of the fathers over and over again around the world, um, from, from all over the world throughout the development of Christianity have spoken about how dangerous this is. Even if they've been some of the wisest people that have walked um, this earth. So that is a very, Good question. The answer then to that, I know that that's not directly answering it, but um, can a theologian be regarded a true Christian? That depends on the heart. It always depends on the heart, not on the title. Um, I guess the other side of that is, can you be a true Christian without being somewhat of a theologian? And the answer to that, um, there's actually another quote from another uh, mother of the church. She's um, an abbess from a monastery um, in Serbia, and her name is uh, escaping me right now, but she spoke about how when we say theologian, we might think a book and a very academic atmosphere and a degree. Um, but in reality, theologian at the root of it is the love of God. Um, and so there I have, she says, you know, in my opinion, there have been many theologians who may not have a degree, who may not have studied theology in books, but their love for God and their love for others 
is so palpable um, that they've been able to reach points where they can hear the trees and the plants sing and they and they cry when they see a woman who's who's with child um, not because they're overly sensitive but because they've reached such a deep love of God of nature and of others that that it's so palpable for them that it's it's present every single moment of their life and they might not have ever read a theological book in their whole life um, and so it really depends on how you define theologian. Um, if you define it that way, there's many, many, many people who are theologians and they haven't actually studied theology per se. Yeah. Ross, yes, you have another question. Yes. Oh, yeah. you're going to you're going to spend most of your time answering questions. I think. Okay, so, uh, Rossi, Rossi Praise, um, you can go, go ahead. Rossi. Rossi Praise, oh. Yes, you're unmuted. Go ahead. Okay. Okay, okay. I'm just going to um, say this quickly. Uh, yeah, you've answered partially well, according to my own perspective. But, you know, when the only place I found that what your answer was when you said, uh, is when you said um, a theologian may not, may not be someone who has a degree. I want to believe before you are titled a theologian, you, the word itself, theology, is a study, a study of God, nature of God, books about God. And then when you are called a theologian, it's because you have a certificate to back you up, right? Yeah. Okay, so, and everything that has to do with theology is divine, divine, right? Divinity, yes, right? Yes. yes. Okay, and then uh, I want to believe such title is because you've gone deep into the study of God. And primarily, primarily, I think the only basic, the basic way you can have a knowledge of God is the Bible. Mm. No matter how it has been translated now or, you know, how it has evolved now from, you know, the scroll to the, uh, you know, to the, from the Holy Bible to NIV or whatever, <laughs> kind of bible it is now but the bible basically talks about god just mm -hmm. like we have different textbooks that talks about different fields of profession okay so my my question or my my doubts is this i always use my daughter as a case study most times she comes home with disturbing questions because i've taught her from infancy you know the practical way how a christian should behave and then when she comes she tells me oh my religious teacher said this said that uh, um like everything most things he or she teaches goes is contrarily to the bible and then he or she will say well uh, i'm just teaching you because i'm your religious teacher but i'm not saying you should believe in it mm. i find that very disturbing you understand like when you read and you teach a child and they, you, you know, you teach thesis about, okay, maybe how Moses parted the Red Sea and it was instructed by God. He said, well, it can, it may be a fiction. I don't really believe in the Bible. Right. And you have studied, you have studied, you have graduated as a theologian. They've right. employed you as a Bible teacher. Right. You've read it, you saw the proof. I say, well, I just have to teach you, but you don't have to believe it. And then the child becomes confused. And okay, then she thank, comes, thank look you. at what my thank teacher just said. What do you have to say to that? Go ahead. You know? thank, so thank that you for was your why question. I asked that question. I don't know. We're going to let Sophia Petro answer now. <laughs> thank you, Rossi. Thank you, Rossi. Um, that is a very good point. You know, at, in all my years at seminary, it's something that I really think is, is more of a modern phenomenon, which is that many seminaries and schools that were originally places of faith, right, and religion might still have those roots, but many people graduate in possibly theological, you know, theological degrees, and they do not personally believe, and they've studied a degree more for the, um, the academic or the philosophical interest that they may have in the formation of the church or the fathers, and that's more of a new thing, to be honest. That's not something that, you know, we've probably seen more in the past 100 years, um, and I'm, I'm usually very much a, a thinker and less than, than diving into my, um, 
you know, I, I've, I've met people who, who have studied this and they're not necessarily religious or spiritual. Um, and it does make me sad because I have a personal, I have a personal love of, of my faith and the tradition. Um, but I, I look at the landscape that we have nowadays and there's so many voices that are trying to pull us in so many directions. And so I see why that might happen. It's almost as if a person who studies it is, is being called or, or has some type of a magnetism towards it, but they can't bring themselves to personally say that, you know, I'm gonna let it affect my life and, and infiltrate every single action that I make. And I'm gonna let it change every single thing that I say, because once you, if you say that you do believe in this as, as, a, as, some, as a reality for you, you if, if, you're, if you're into logic and, and understand the significance of that, then that means you have to let go of a lot of other things um, that, that the faith might call you to do, and that might be uncomfortable. So it is, it is a reality. Like you said, a lot of people who have the theological or religious degrees don't necessarily believe, and that is something that one should know going into the world. Every person you meet might not necessarily personally believe it, um, and that's why I say it depends on your, on your definition, because, you know, if you, if you want to define theologian as, okay, theologian for me is they have a degree and they personally believe in God. If you want to say, okay, well, what about what about you know um, one of these ascetics or monastics who uh, miraculously have been illumined with the entire with the entire scripture and they can quote scripture to you and they don't even have a degree and like you said they they have all the knowledge of these scriptures and the gospel and the messages and they've never sat in a classroom how could they be less of a theologian than me for example who doesn't know the whole Bible by memory <laughs> but they do. <laughs> And they haven't been in a classroom, so it's it's a really beautiful topic. Um, and like everything in the in the tradition of the church, unlike being like a one size fits all and it's a black and white answer, it's it's so nuanced. And I think that's beautiful. But thank you for bringing that up. Uh, let's go to another question from Tangavel Copen. Yes, I've seen his hand for a while. Yeah, he's been there. Okay, hi everyone. Thank Hello. you, sir, for giving the opportunity. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Hi, Sophia. Hello. Okay, my question is, hey, I, I am uh, we, in Mauritius, we are a multiracial country. So we are, we have Hindus, Muslim, Christian, and Chinese. So last West Wednesday, the pupils where I working in a college, they have gone for celebrating the ashes. Now they are fasting for Easter. Okay, uh, they have gone for celebration, ashes have gone to the church, and some pupils did not go. So I asked one of them, they told me, I, I am not a Catholic face, I'm a Christian. So I want to know what is the difference between Catholic face and Christian face, because they both are praying for Jesus. Right. Yes, is, is, I don't want to put you off. Was there anything else you wanted, you were going to say? Or was that the question? Okay, I want to say, well, what is the difference between the Catholic faith and Christian faith? Because they are both praying for Jesus. Right, Why right. is not go to the church for the actual celebration? Right, so that is a really good question. So I'm going to assume that the person who said, I'm Christian, not Catholic, um, probably is of one of the branches of the Protestant church. Or from the Protestant Reformation, um, and of course, it depends on, like you said, you know, which country you're in, um, and um, so that that is that depends a lot on the terms that we use. So that's why I'm going to assume that this person probably is from the Protestant Church. Um, now, the Roman Catholic Church. I'm going to just go back really quick to this slide because this might help a little bit. Um, okay. All right. So. If you see on the bottom right there, like we said, the, the great schism on the bottom right, up till that point, there had been divisions, but all of the Christian world up to this point was in essentially the Orthodox church. And when I say Orthodox, Orthodox wasn't considered a branch. It was just a term that meant orthos, which is in Greek, true or, or genuine, and doxia, belief. So up till then, there wasn't another term to describe the Christian faith. It was just the faith. 
when we hit 1054, at this point, there had been so many arguments between the West and the Eastern, the Western and the Eastern church is when we have the first such major division that we now have what's called the Western Roman Catholic Christian church and the Eastern Orthodox Christian church. Um, so this person who said I'm Christian probably came from one of the churches with its roots in what came from the Protestant Reformation. Um, I'm not sure if you're, are you familiar Tangavel with, with Martin Luther King and his theses and, and how that Reformation split off from the Roman Catholic Church? Sorry? Are, are you familiar with Martin Luther, Martin Luther and his 95 theses? No. No. So he was a man who in England was disagreeing with the Western Church, the Roman Catholic Church, and began the Protestant Christian Church. So that person who said, oh, I'm Christian, probably came from that from a church of that tradition. And those who were going to church for the beginning of Lent or before Easter were from the Roman Catholic Christian church. Does that kind of clear things up a little bit, Tangavel? Yeah. Okay, and forgive me if I'm, I'm not able to go as in depth. Um, these, these are all very complicated topics. Okay, yeah, I, wanna, I wanna steer us back to yeah. the topic of mental health with a question by Asen Banda, who says, how does mental health affect faith? Does mental health produce faith? Is faith produced out of mental health problems? Right, right. Well, to answer, uh, I missed who, what the person's name was, but I think that this next slide will fit really nicely into that question. Let me see if I can find it really quick because I want to make sure that I directly, um, let's see where it was. Who was that person, Dr. Edward, that last question you read? Uh, Dr. Edward, who was, who was that last person that you read the question from so I can pull it up here in the chat and have it in front of me? Oh, I think Dr. Edward, you're muted. Yes, do you want me to read the question? Yes, please, please. Can you read it again for me? How does mental health affect faith in the modern generation? Okay, yes. All right, so I think this next slide will fit really nicely into that question, to be honest. Um, it just so happens it fits nicely. So you're asking if mental health produces faith. This has a lot to do with this other misunderstanding that has to do with fear, essentially, and it's Mental illness comes from not being thankful enough for God's blessing. And if we are thankful for God's blessing, then we can steer clear of mental illness, which also implies if I'm mentally healthy, then that in some way shows that I'm in a, in a good space with God if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm doing well mentally and I don't have any issues, okay? But in actuality, there's, there's problematic statements there because of course, of course, being close to God, being close to Christ and the saints is for our holistic well-being. Um, and to be healthy, not in a superficial sense of, I don't need to go to doctor's appointments, not that type of health, but a holistic health of mind, body, and soul, um, which of course is obvious in the fact that Christ didn't minister to, he didn't hang out with people who were um, who were healthy 100%, right? If anything, he hung out with those that were the low, lowly of the, of the lowest caste of, um, from society. So the way that um, the tradition responds to this problematic view, I brought up this quote here from St. Basil, and he talks about thankfulness within our church. And there's a Greek word, eucharistia. And as some of you may know, if you speak another language besides English, um, or maybe more than two languages, there are some words that can't be totally described in another language and their fullness is only appreciated in, in the language that they're, um, that they're originally said in. But this word that essentially means thankfulness, it denotes an active, grateful language that involves our entire body for, to God. And in this thankfulness, there is a pushing away from having despair and, and decay alone and really coming together as a community because you can't come close to God if you're not close to a community in one way, that at least in the tradition of 
if the context that we're talking about here in the ancient tradition of, of the church. And when that community comes together, there is a trust in God's infinite compassion and people come together. And so if one were to ask, does mental health or mental health stability, does that engender closeness to God or does closeness to God engender mental health stability? Mm, it doesn't, it's not a one-way stream. It's not either upstream or downstream. It's this, it's this constant working together of our, of, our, of our bodies. And one of the best ways to describe this is this thankfulness that is ever present, even when trials come, come a person's way. Um, and St. Basil actually goes on to speak about in the Orthodox Christian tradition, we have Holy Communion um, during liturgies. And it's not just on Sunday, it could be had at different parts of the week. And in the, in the, um, in the faith and in the belief of the church, when the faithful participate in this sacrament together, they're coming together as one body with Christ. And it's like, the, it's the ultimate um, way that everyone comes together. Like um, the, the, the communion and the, and the feasting that takes place and being able to participate in this together in, in our tradition, it is the pinnacle of, of thankfulness, of community and communing together um, within that sacrament. It's very mystical. Um, I see a lot more questions, so I, I want to, I'm going to, if that's all right, Dr. Edward, and um, of course you can kind of direct me what your thoughts are, but I was going to take another question. All right, <clears throat> let's go to Ong Zhao Kin. Let me ask you to unmute. Please go ahead with your question. Hello, good evening, Professor. Thank you so much for giving me the floor, and thank you so much, Sophie. Sophia Petro. So um, I'm from Myanmar. I would like, um, I'm a Buddhist. So uh, I would like to know about the, if the Christianity has the kind of stages in the Buddhist. I, I'm not that kind of, I'm not religious, but I'm um, logically studying all the religions as far as, far as possible. So um, in the Buddhist, when I ask to the monks, they say that they, they have 31 stages. After this human life, they have uh, like 19 stages above the human life. And there are uh, below human life is the worst. It's like demons, and spirits, ghosts, etc. So if they good do human do good, they will go to the good stage. And by doing more good, uh, they pass many levels and they reach to the end of the suffering where they complete all 31 stages, which is called heaven. Heaven means end of the circle, end of the suffering. There is no suffering and there is no circulation of lives and spirits. So does the uh, Christianity also have this kind of stages between human and heaven? or between human and hell? Are there any other stages? Yes. Yes, thank you so much for your question. Um, so I, of course, I'm, I'm not as familiar with the Buddhist tradition. I've studied it um, a little bit in some of my courses. I will say that there are, there are stages to the spiritual life in this world. Um, many of the monks and ascetics from our tradition speak um and, and and in the orthodox church like so many other things there are certain things that are very clear in in that the theology um is not uh vague and it's and it's very clearly set out from the councils and the fathers that have set up the tradition and then there are other things that there are many voices from different saints um so unlike from what i've understood the Buddha, buddhist tradition there aren't necessarily um, across the board a certain number of steps that all fathers and all saints will say oh there's these many steps it's these many and it's always these many and it's in this order um depending on which saint from which century we're talking about um there's there's there are definitely stages and some of these main ones are um natural contemplation um and and of course in these stages, there isn't necessarily like a wall between them where if you reach one stage, um, it's impossible that you'll ever go back. Um, a lot of the saints actually talk about that 
just because, um, you know, a person in and of themselves shouldn't even try to say which stage they're at, but instead have a spiritual father or an elder that is guiding you so that you're humble because a person in and of themselves should not kind of dictate and say, oh, I'm at this point now and I can do this. Um, always to be done with direction. Um, in, terms of, in terms of after having died, there, uh, there is the belief that there is a time that one soul kind of sleeps and it's a, a prelude to what is to come once Christ comes back. So the belief is that the soul is in a state of kind of sleep. And then one day it'll be reunited with Christ at the final judgment. And that's kind of the belief of what happens after death. There, there is no, unlike, for example, the Roman Catholic Church, there's no purgatory. Um, there isn't a waiting place. And whatever is done in this world is in this world. And there really isn't um, changes once, once one passes away. It's kind of a time of waiting and sleep. So I don't know if that kind of answers your question. Um, so we, I'm not sure. Yes, more thank you so much, Sophie Petru. May I have another one? Yes. So uh, it's a kind of a movie, Constantine. You may have watched the Kenny Reeves starring. So which, which movie? Constantine. I don't know. I don't think I've seen it. No. It's like an exorcist. So I the the Hollywood movie and the actor is the Kenny Reeves, the metric movie star. Okay, okay. So he's starring there and he he is um, exorcist. So he removes the devil uh, uh, spirit from the human body. Yeah, I haven't uh, seen it. No. Did you have a did you have a question? Yes, I have question is that uh, my question is that um, uh, do the Christian priest also uh, do this this uh, this uh, ex exorcism? I guess yeah. the question is: Is mental health sometimes just a demon within the person? Right. So that yes. I see. Yes. So, yeah, yes, so, so within the church, there are exorcist prayers. Um, I once spoke with a missionary, and he was saying how because there was the gospel, there's a gospel in the scripture of when Christ um, exercises a demon, out, actually many demons outside of a, of a person in the gospel. And this missionary was telling me, you know, Sophia, in this country, there are so many distractions. We have come to a point that we are so distracted by social media, by the internet, by who knows, whatever we see on the daily, that he said, you know, this isn't, this isn't theological, this doesn't like, you know, theologically, um, spoken about in a council but he said in my opinion i believe there are less possessions and less activity for example in the demonic realm only because we were already so distracted and this was his opinion of course but the reality is in the church that's not an everyday thing the there are exorcist prayers where that might happen at some point of course yes we do believe in that but that really isn't something that on the daily a priest or even in the mental health world, we're as concerned about. Um, and I thought that was really, really insightful. And um, it was grounded in reality. And yet it was very theologically sound in that he was saying how, and I think about my own life, I'm, I'm so distracted, I can't sit for more than five minutes. And I'm, my mind's constantly thinking about all the things I have to do. Um, it's so hard for me to be silent and to sit in, in, in prayer. So he was kind of reflecting that, um, if anything, the, the enemy, doesn't have to worry because we're such distracted beings. Um, so that's that's something that I, I want to share in terms of um, demons and and exorcisms. Yes. So Dr. Edward, would you like me? Do you want to give me more questions? Do you want me to keep going? What are your? What would you? <laughs> I know there, we only have five minutes, so there are there are many questions which seem to be off topic of this idea of mental health. Yes. And and using religion. To, to really help somebody who is in that stage of mental health problems. Right. So I, I really want the questions to focus in on that topic because I have a feeling you're going to be back and talk about other things later at another time. So if we can just focus in on mental health in this live lesson, much better. Okay, okay. Would you like me to continue or, will, or am I gonna, 
I suggest you continue with your presentation so we get some more ideas focusing in on mental health. All right. Okay, so another misunderstanding I'd like to bring up here is I've also heard that mentally ill people in any capacity, whether it might be serious or not, they need a mental health professional more than a friend. And ultimately this stems from fear, again, a from the fear of wanting to get involved in another person's mess. Um, there's often a type of shying away and saying, well, that's not my problem. If, if they need help, I can't help them. I, I, it's not a friend, they just need some professional help. Now, from a theological point of view, from steeped in the tradition of the faith, we look at the Gospel of Matthew and we have a quote there when Christ kind of has this, this picture of the final judgment and he's speaking to the people who he says minister to him in prison when he was hungry, when he was sick and when he needed help. And, and those that helped him, they say, when did, we, when did we see you in prison or when were you sick or clothe you? And he, and he tells them that they did it to him when they did it to the least of these, meaning the lowest of the low people in society. So this type of, this type of service is, is, there's a word in Greek, there's different types of love in Greek. And the highest of these is agape, agapi. Um, in, in Greek with the Greek accent, agapi. And that true love is even higher than friendship. So, so this type of um, misunderstanding that might happen where someone says, oh, they don't need a friend, they need a mental health professional. Not only do they need a friend and are we called to do this type of love, but we're actually called to an even higher standard, which is agapi, which is a type of love that is completely sacrificial and puts the other person totally in front of yourself. And if we want to talk about what the faith says that we should be doing, that's the type of love we're called to. And so that's the, the intrinsic problem with this type of, um, I don't really want to deal with it statement. Another problem that has to do again with the topic of dichotomizing and just separating these two fields. And we kind of talked about this before is I've heard people say that someone with mental illness, they can't really connect with God. They, they have a handicap because they're not totally whole. There's something wrong with them. They're not able to connect. You need to be healthy to a certain extent to fully connect and commune with God. And others with problems, they just can't. And again, some people, this might come out of fear or whatever issues or problems, but I've heard it, I've heard it said before. The answer to this, I think there's a beautiful quote from St. Gregory the Theologian who lived in the fourth century. And he has this quote, and in, in, in Greek, it's, it's even, um, if you're able to read the Greek, it's, it, it's even easier to understand, but the best translation, that which is not assumed is not healed. And in this case, assumed is, um, is a word that has to do with taking on. And what he's referring to here is that when Christ took on human flesh, when he became when the incarnation took place, he completely became human and took on all of the sufferings and everything that it means to be in the struggle of being a human person. And in the moment that that happened, humanity was healed. And that doesn't mean healed in the sense that we're not gonna have issues anymore, but there's a new opportunity for communication and communion and, and oneness with the human person and God that was impossible before. That is what the tradition of the faith teaches. And so this statement that, oh, well, there's some people that aren't whole and they can't attain, they just can't attain to communion with God. It's, if, if that is the case, then you can't have, that doesn't match with the, with the teaching of the incarnation and what St. Gregory is saying here, that, that Christ completely took on the human condition. There isn't one area of the human condition that hasn't been touched. Um, by, by the incarnation and ultimately salvation. So I do see we're at 11 o'clock here, Dr. Edward. I don't want to go over time. I understand. So do you want to finish up with any uh, final words? Um, no, I, I mean, I really enjoyed speaking with everyone here today. I, I had a feeling this would kind of happen. I had many slides prepared in case there weren't questions, but I had a feeling that it might be difficult to get through all of them. Um, I could talk about this for, for, for hours, obviously. <laughs> I think it would be good just to give a summary of some of the concepts we've talked about so far. There's sure. mental, mental health, there's reason, faith, 
there's demons, there's this process of stages of spirituality, and and people are different stages, and how do you get from one stage to another, and how do you find that? We never really talked about peace, how to find peace. We talked about faith and, and trying to use faith to overcome some of these mental problems, but I think there's some gaps still in in connecting these dots that we really didn't flesh out in the presentation because of the other questions coming in from other other angles of looking at this yes yes that was definitely coming later in the presentation um but yes to kind of summarize and i'll just give a quick blip into what was coming in terms of of finding balance and peace um there will be many voices that try to find separation. And the main most important thing to remember is that doesn't need to happen. Um, The ancient tradition never separated these two as being unrelated. That is a modern problem and a modern tendency. That's not me saying it, it's 2000 years of tradition. And even before than 2000 years, even in the Hebrew tradition, it's never been separated. It's always been um, very intricately related, our mind, our body and our soul. That's number one in terms of separation. And then in terms of finding peace and balance in life, again, there are so many modern practices that have to do with finding inner peace and practices, right? There's there's practices that we can do mentally, that we can do with our body. And those are wonderful. Those are good. Um, I know for myself that it's very difficult to sit and finally reach a point where I'm peaceful because I've been able to shut down all my thoughts and stresses. Again, In the ancient tradition of not just the Christian faith, but the so many other faiths as well, it's always been part of the human condition, which is why I think since the beginning of of humanity that we can have any type of um, record, the human person has always strived to find this communion with the divine and find peace and find balance. And of course, each tradition regardless of what you're looking at, might have different practices to do this. But at the but what's important to remember is the human person has been striving at this for centuries, and it's only become more difficult, more and more difficult now, because we have so many digital distractions and um, our computers and, and TVs. And so if that might be modern, that's definitely modern, how many distractions we have. But the human person striving for peace and balance and doing exercises and and having introspection and putting work into that, that is something that the human person has been doing since the beginning of time. And in all ancient faiths and traditions, um, it's it's not something new that that we're doing now. If anything, we're just trying to address the modern problems and extra distractions we have nowadays. Okay, do you feel comfortable that that's a good ending point? Yes, I, I yes, I I'm I'm happy with where we've reached today. And with Dr. Dr. Ricardo Gonzalez, would you like to have her back for more? Oh, absolutely. Uh, it was a very eloquent presentation, and in fact, we can tell Sophia that uh, whenever we have a successful presenter, it foments a lot of participation. So the indication that we didn't get through the slides is uh, is a sure proof of uh, your your excellent. Uh, delivery and thought-provoking presentation. So thank you so much for being here with us today and sharing with our students. Uh, And thank you students uh, for for participating today. I hope you guys can join us in our live classes every day. We we have them at 10 a.m. for you and at 3 p.m. And uh, I I really hope that this can motivate you to continue learning after this live class because the idea is uh, you, you, you are in a journey of perpetual evolution and growth. And uh, these classes are just to uh, kind of uh, pique your interest uh, and to get you excited about researching and learning on your own andragogically as, uh, as we advocate at, at AIU. Um, so I, I know that what Sophia presented for us today uh, gives us a lot of opportunity to kind of further expand and, 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 and build our knowledge. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Sophia, for being here. Yeah, I would just like to add that wherever you live, whatever religion you're a part of, you will find people with mental health problems. So help them. 
if you can use your faith and your spiritual teachings to help them, that is the key. Sophia Petro, we'll give you the floor to end this. Thank you, Dr. Edward, and thank you, Dr. Ricardo, for having me, and thank you all for your participation. I really enjoyed having time with you all today. <laughs>